I'm Charlie Wright with Gold Derby, and as part of our Behind the Lens Meet the Experts panel for documentary filmmakers, we're talking with Dan Kogan, the producer of the of the documentary Becoming Cousteau from National Geographic. Uh, first question I wanted to ask Dan was, what about Cousteau or his life made Liz Garbus, the director, want to explore uh, want to explore uh, everything about him? You know, Cousteau was this extraordinary figure. He was one of the best known men in the world in the 1970s and 80s. And then he completely dropped off the map. And, um, you know, Liz and I are not only a uh, producer and director, but also we're married and we were reading uh, a book to our 70 year old son. We had found this book, you know, who is Jacques Cousteau? Like, you know, who is Gandhi and who is Martin Luther King? And he had no idea. And reading that book to him, it made us realize that this was this extraordinary man who really opened up the world of the oceans for the entire globe in the 50s and 60s, and then had this extraordinary television hit in the 1970s that had millions of people falling in love with the oceans and with the animals in it, and his legacy was being forgotten. And it was really that desire to bring him back, particularly at this moment, of the dangers and threats to the oceans through climate change that inspired us to make the film. Uh, did you have a personal connection uh, with uh, the works of Jacques Cousteau before uh, becoming involved with this documentary? Yes, my personal connection was being, you know, seven years old and sitting on the floor in front of my television and being wowed when I was shown his world of sharks or the story of the whales or, or sea anemones or, you know, every Sunday night it was Wild Kingdom and um, Jacques Cousteau. And, uh, and I, you know, it inspired me to see differently and to want to understand the world that I was in and to understand the animals that were in it. And it was just shocking to me when I realized that that incredible legacy um, was disappearing. And, and that's what began a six year journey to make this film, to make contact with uh, the Cousteau archives and to explore what could be done and to see if we could bring Cousteau back into the cultural conversation at this important moment. What aspect of uh, Jacques Cousteau's life were you most surprised to learn about from uh, the, this documentary? Because I, as I can only imagine, you know, having, like you said, you know, watching and being enamored by his work when you were so young, uh, it must have been. There must have been a lot of things in this process that surprised yeah. you. I was wondering what you found the most surprising. So, you know, as a child, I knew of him um, as uh, someone who believed in conservation of the world's oceans and the creatures within it. But what you what we learned when we dug into the movie was at first he began simply as an adventurer. He loved swimming underwater. He did it actually, he began doing it to, to rehabilitate from a terrible car accident. And, um, and he just loved seeing this world that, he, that no one really had ever seen before. And uh, he then became an inventor because he literally helped create, he was one of two people who created the Aqualung, the first sort of scuba equipment so that he could stay down longer. So he went from being an adventurer um, to being an inventor. And then it was only um, after uh, a long time in his, into his 50s and 60s that he realized this world that he had fallen in love with, that he had uncovered for the world was under threat. And you know, one of the interesting things we learned about him was that in order to pay for his adventures and his explorations, he um, did a lot of oil prospecting. You know, he found oil for a lot of um, countries in the Gulf on the Calypso. And it's something that we don't think of Jacques Cousteau as connected to, but this was before anyone knew about the impact of fossil fuels on climate change. It was before there was climate change that was recognized. You know, we're talking in the 50s and, and into the 60s. And so, um, it was fascinating to learn that this was a guy who fell in love with the world, then did some things that now we would look back as, you know, not um, good for, for the long-term health of that world, and then changed. He changed, he evolved, and the things that he once did, um, he would never do again, and he fought against. And, I, and to me, that story of evolution is incredibly inspiring because that's what we need right now. You know, we just had COP26, and it so far, has not been as successful, I think, as many activists had hoped. And um, what we need to know as human beings is that we can change. We don't have to be the same. We don't have to be reliant on fossil fuels. We don't have to have the same positions on energy that we've had for the last hundred years. We can all evolve. And I think Cousteau offers, offers us an example of someone who evolved and then tried to make a difference. 
uh, one of the other striking things about uh, uh, that documentary, about what we see about Cousteau in this documentary, is, uh, it, and correct me if I'm wrong, but he, it, it seemed like he, when you look at, you know, all the hyphenates of everything that he was, he personally considered himself to be a filmmaker above everything else. And I was wondering if you could just speak to that to a little bit. Yeah, it's such a great question because it was something that we thought a lot about as storytellers. You know, we wanted to make a feature length film about Cousteau. We didn't want to make a series. And his life was so rich and extraordinary that we really had to focus on what is the aspect of his story that we're going to tell. There's a whole world of his work in the underground in World War II in France fighting against the Nazis that's incredibly rich. And there's, um, and there's his work at the end of his life that's rich. And we, we decided to focus on this arc, this evolution. But um, his life as a storyteller, purely as a filmmaker, is incredibly important. You know, this is a guy who Louis Mal called one of the great directors of all time. You know, Louis Mal, the great French director, started, he was an intern for Jacques Cousteau on Calypso and, you know, and grew into being his cameraman. And, um, and so he talks about Cousteau's unbelievable um, sense of cinema and story and editing and, um, he was, in his mind, he was first and foremost a filmmaker. You know, he bought his first camera when he was 13. Um, and he uh, had been making movies ever since. And he built one of the first housings for a camera to shoot underwater. He spent an enormous amount of time building new lighting so that he could shoot underwater that was safe to shoot with underwater. So his he was a filmmaker in his soul, but what what he shot came from the part of him that was an adventurer and the way he did it came from the part of him that, that was an inventor. And it's all these different hats that he wore that make him such an incredibly rich and inspiring figure. Do you think that there is anyone that we currently have in our society, whether it be in entertainment or in science or, you know, the overlap <sighs> between the two that who occupies the same kind of pop culture level that Jacques yeah. Cousteau had in our society? It's Charlie, it's such a great question. And the sad, incredibly sad answer is no. You know, this is a guy who at the Rio, the first Earth Summit was in Rio in 1992. And um, Cousteau was the leader, one of the leaders of that summit. And at that event, he had, he had time where he sat with President Bush. He had time where he sat with Fidel Castro. He had time where he sat with Russians. Like he was incredibly respected by figures all over the world of all political persuasions. You know, there's a, they do a photograph with the world leaders at the end, and he's the only person who is not a government official. They called him Captain Planet. And he was in the official photograph of Rio. And he spoke to and had influence on everyone of all political persuasions. And that in our polarized world, that kind of figure, it's, it sadly doesn't exist. And, um, you know, it's 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 something that Liz and I thought a lot about, like, who is it today who is the new Jacques Cousteau? And really, it 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 doesn't exist. And it and it speaks to part of Cousteau's legacy, which is we have to try to build a sense of um, commonality around our goals to protect um, both human civilization and the oceans. And that's what Cousteau would be doing right now if he could. Lastly, I did want to ask, we are an award site, so um, uh, you uh, did win an Oscar uh, in 2017 for Best Documentary Feature uh, as uh, the producer of uh, Brian Fogel's documentary Icarus. I was wondering, what was that experience like for you when that happened? Um, you know, you don't ever think it's actually going to happen. I mean, you know, um, and that film was such a, a crazy, uh, stressful ride. Um, in and of itself, protecting this whistleblower um, um, from the Russians who wanted to assassinate him and hiding him in America. And so it was you know, that, that period of my life seems in some way like such a blur of intensity and um, adrenaline. And uh, that particular moment, it just felt very humbling because, um, you know, that room is a room of, of, of people who, as a storyteller, you admire and look up to and um, see his role models and to, to be recognized in that room was just a, an, an incredible honor and somewhat surreal. One other question I, I meant to ask uh, beforehand, um, uh, was there any attempt uh, to uh, have uh, uh, 
Cousteau's uh, other son from his first wife, Jean-Michel, uh, be a part of this documentary? Yeah, we talked about that a lot. I mean, one of the sad things about the Cousteau legacy is that his family is at war. Um, you know, he had two different, he had two wives and um, uh, his second wife has an enormous amount of conflict with the rest of the family. And there are many generations of Cousteaus and they're all doing wonderful work, but they have not been able to find a way to work together. And um, it's just a sort of sad part of that legacy, but it's also one that doesn't speak to who Cousteau was and, and his impact on the world. It's sort of the private side. And, and we thought about, do we wanna tell that story? And ultimately it's not a story that's about his legacy. It's a story sort of about the private, you know, uh, legal squabblings of an estate. And, you know, I've worked on many, many films with the estates of famous people. And it's always sadly like this. There's always fighting over who gets to control it and who gets the money and all of that. And, um, and it's very sad. And it was a sad, it was a sad part of his legacy. And I think in some ways it's prevented him from having the legacy with young generations that he has now. So our goal with the film was just don't get into that. Let's focus on who Cousteau was as a figure. Let's revive him for young people all over the world and let's him have influence as uh, the conservationist that he was. Well, Dan, uh, thank you so much for joining us for this panel. And we look forward to having you for our group chat in just a little bit. Thanks so much. Wonderful. Thank you, Charlie. Appreciate it. I'm Charlie Bright with Gold Derby, and I am speaking with Elena Fortes, the producer of the Netflix documentary, A Cop Movie, for this Behind the Lens Meet the Experts panel. Uh, first question I wanted to ask about this movie is the structure of this movie is very intense. Uh, and I was, curi <laughs> and I was curious, uh, where did the idea for the structure of this documentary come from? Um... I'll try to say it in a way that doesn't give out too much because because that's part of the experience of watching the film. But um, I guess, I mean, it, it was a very collaborative project. Daniela and I come from the documentary world and, and Alonso has worked, uh, had worked in fiction uh, before and, and theater. And, you know, we, we knew that we wanted to work together. And the first kind of driving point was uh, making something that would um, explain to ourselves the impunity crisis in Mexico in the justice system. So um, uh, basically, the film is the story of two Mexico City police officers, how they enter the, the system and what happens. And there's a love story between them. And then uh, we have uh, two actors that, in order to interpret the police officers, were infiltrated in police academies and patrolled the streets and spent just a, a long time uh, with police officers. So the, the film combines uh, both experiences. And I guess um, we wanted the journey of the filmmaking process itself um, and the journey of the actors in this immersive process to somehow reflect our own journey in understanding um, why that, especially the relationship between citizens and police officers is so broken. And, you know, it's broken pretty much everywhere for different reasons, but um, that was, I guess, the driving point for the structure is making that kind of multi-layered experience happen for everyone, you know, in the, in the process of making the film and in the process of watching the film. Where did uh, Al Al Alonso, the director of the film, get the idea to do a documentary about the police department in Mexico City? So we, we basically had a two year um, research period where we interviewed just a bunch of system working, bunch of people working within the justice system. And originally we wanted to follow a case through kind of like a public prosecuting office. But, you know, that had no cinematic potential. And um, eventually like, we, we started just talking to and interviewing a lot of police officers and, and experts that have worked with the police and, you know, cops. The cop movie genre, it, you know, is is very, you know, it's, it, 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 there was a lot of potential there to play around also with the genre and with the audience expectations. So, um, so we decided to focus on, on on cops and also because they are kind of like our first point of entry into this very dysfunctional uh, system. Uh, so it was a, you know, it was kind of like a, a, a huge challenge for everyone involved. And in a way, you know, we felt that we were all jumping into a void <laughs> making this film that could have been a massive failure. But uh, on the other hand, it just presented so many, you know, cha creative challenges um, 
in how we were going to combine fiction and documentary and playing around with cop movie, playing around with audience expectations, but also doing something that could have an impact. You know? um, what was the casting process like in trying to find the people to play uh, Teresa and Montoya? It wasn't, I mean, it wasn't that long. It, it was, you know, Raul is actually a uh, part of Alonso's theater company. So he had worked with him a lot. And Monica um, is an actress that, you know, all her work is is characterized by being extremely immersive. So so they were both used to these experiences and they were very, they are very brave uh, actors. And um, uh, yeah, so that, I mean, that was, that didn't take uh, long. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm still asked, struck by what they had to go through in order to interpret these characters because there were many risks involved in the process um but you know i i, I think once uh, the, there's also a, a you know a play between performance uh in the film you know at some point we 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 realize police officers are really performing a role that they're not necessarily either prepared or you know or have any training to to perform they're they're pretending to be kind of these very you know strong authority authority figures and in reality they aren't so that idea kind of uh just became woven into our, the process so we had uh two theater actors to play the main roles but we also had a troupe of actors that would play different roles in the film um and and so uh, yeah i think um the fact that they come both from from theater and from a very kind of method experience uh, was key in 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 selecting them to play these characters. Was there ever any concern or worry um, that uh, audiences might get a little might, might get a bit confused with the with the narrative structure? Going back to what we, what you were talking about with the narrative structure of how the story was being told. Uh, no, I mean, because that we, we wanted that to happen in a way. I mean, as long as we were also being kind of, you know, giving uh, the viewer the elements to figure out the puzzle, you know, uh, was important. And also being truthful to the story and to our, you know, and to our real life uh subjects throughout um but it no and and it's funny that you ask because we've had you know in 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 sort of the times we've screened the film uh, especially in the us a lot of questions like well you know what is like what are the documentary aspects of it and what are the the fictional aspects of it and there are sometimes when they're blurred and um, that creates even more interesting situations as well but um you know, I think we just were part of a panel, uh, New Directions in Documentary, and I think what's interesting to me is how the entire kind of award system and industry is structured around very strict categories. So you have to kind of fit in your film <laughs> in these. And when, you know, I, I just, we kept asking ourselves, why can't the film just be a film, you know? What, you know, as long, I mean, I, there is definitely a, an ethical responsibility on um that you know we we are more used to in documentary than and that we respect it throughout the process but yeah that that's a interesting question <laughs> uh you know it, it's interesting uh that i'm guessing you were you've been making this movie for a while and um uh here in america um for the past year and a half we've really it feels like we've been facing a reckoning about everything that comes that about 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 how we deal with policing and what policing means in our society. And how do you think, do, do you think that, uh, that, that the film, even though it takes place in another country, do you think that speaks to some of the stuff that's going on right now here in America? I mean, to a certain extent, yes, even though the context, context is different. But I think, you know, for us, it was also a challenge given their kind of police brutality past and human rights violations that are, you know, we, we, we had our own George Floyd happen during the process of making the film. Um, but I think um, it's always a challenge to humanize, you know, per perpetrators or sort of the figure we see as the other, uh, the evil, the bad. And uh, it was really interesting because um, in a way, you know, someone said at a screening, that's what a defunded police looks like. You know, because that's a particular situation of our own police force. Um, and the other thing that was really interesting to me is that in Mexico, it's almost like racism playing in the inverse. You know, police in Mexico are mostly come uh, from in, in indigenous communities. They are 
basically used as bait, you know, uh, thrown out to to combat, you know, the, the um, drug cartels. Uh, so, so that was really interesting. I, 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 I think there are many, many differences, but I do think that there is definitely um, a broken relationship between often police or authorities and citizens in many, many places around the world, and you know, and. It, it raises questions that we ask ourselves when viewing the film from that perspective, from the perspective of, you know, the citizens. So uh, uh, I know the film just got released on Netflix, but since you completed filming, uh, do you know if there have been any noticeable reforms in the police department in Mexico City or if there have been any uh, serious attempts at trying to get some sort of reform uh, in the organization there? Um, yeah, I mean, there was a reform uh, a while back, uh, to, I think it was 2012, but I mean, we, this is a project that we conceived as a film and then, uh, you know, accompanied by an impact campaign. So w the film just very recently premiered in Mexico as well. It premiered the Thursday before um, the release on Netflix and we're doing, uh, you know, uh, screenings with police officers, uh, with some of kind of the, the, the sec heads of security and uh, st state security heads. Um, and then uh, also community screenings and, you know, we have an educational guide. So we're trying to kind of revive that discussion and working with a lot of organizations that have been working on reforming the police for a very long, for at least three years. So, so yeah, I mean, it's the, the film is just meant to kind of, I guess, uh, board that discussion from a different angle and, um, and, and involve viewers, you know, also in their responsibility in this dysfunctionality. Um, uh, you said that you've had uh, screenings with several police officers. Uh, what uh, what has their reaction been to this film? Um, you know, it's, it's, it's funny because if some viewers think that the film kind of paints the police in a very positive light and, and police officers think you know, it paints them in a very negative light. <laughs> so, I mean, that to me was, was a, you know, a good indicator that, that it's, it's definitely balanced in a way, uh, because that was one of the challenges that we, we were worried about just, you know, not being an, uh, kind of apologetic or, you know, overly critical, but being kind of more, you know, as, as truthful as we could be. Um, but yeah, so, so far they, they say that they love the film, but that they wish, you know, that, you we would tell like other stories you know like the, the 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 positive stories but that's something that you know that's that then becomes part of something else i think you know becomes part of, of the conversation and the campaign and that's also you know we did that screening at the in the office of a major newspaper in mexico and the newspaper you know committed to telling those stories sending their journalists to spend 24 hours with the police and you know so so it's 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 exciting it's an exciting time now because it's just being kind of um it's discovering its path also here in where you know where we wanted the film to have the most impact well elena thank you so much for joining us i uh, wish you all the best and we look forward to having you join us back for our group panel in just a little bit thank you charlie <laughs> i'm charlie bright with gold derby and i'm speaking with Betsy West and Julie Cohen, the directors of the Amazon original documentary. My name is Polly Murray as part of our Behind the Lens Meet the Experts panels. Uh, first question I wanted to ask about this documentary was, um, uh, and uh, Betsy, I'll throw it to you first. Um, uh, how did you first come across uh, Polly Murray's work? Well, uh, Polly Murray was a person way ahead of the times. And we first learned about Polly from Ruth Bader Ginsburg when we were making RBG. Uh, Ginsburg credited Polly with coming up with the foundational strategy to win equal rights for women. But after RBG, we did a little research and des discovered the incredible breadth of this person's life. An activist who refused to go to to the back of the bus in 1940, a uh, civil rights lawyer who had a profound influence on Thurgood Marshall, uh, an amazing writer, a poet, a uh, non-binary person who had such a profound impact on our society, but has not yet been significantly recognized by history. And Julia, did you, was there anything you wanted to add to that? 
<laughs> um, you know, truthfully, the scope of Polly's contributions to society are uh, huge enough that um, <laughs> we could go on almost indefinitely. I mean, Polly's writings are spectacular from a family memoir um, to an autobiography to um, collections of poetry uh, published during Polly's lifetime. Um, you know, the, the, the labor activism that Polly did, the, uh, the impact that Polly had as the first black female identified Episcopal priest. It's like, there's almost so much to this person's life. You can't believe a, that it happened and B that this is someone you didn't learn about in your elementary school, social studies, uh, textbook. And, uh, uh, Julie, I'll direct this next question to you. Um, uh, was, uh, you know, I, I can imagine for both you and Betsy that, you know, this was, you know, quite an undertaking to do this documentary about someone who you're learning so much about as you're doing all as you're as you're making this film. And uh, I was wondering uh, what aspect of Polly's life did you find uh, to be the most striking? So much of this story was striking, I think, on an emotional level. Um, we were deeply struck by Polly's description during Lifetime of uh, the gender identity um, issues. You know, Polly, as early as 1940, was at, writing to doctors saying, while I appear to be a woman, I'm actually a man. Could somebody do exploratory surgery on me? Could I get testosterone treatment? All of these questions that science decades later would come to understand um, actually were quite uh, prescient and correct questions, but at the time, there was no language for Polly to say, you know, I think I'm a trans man, I'm, I may be non-binary, like, the, there, there weren't words for this, and yet Polly was boldly approaching doctors, making these requests, getting back these painfully dismissive responses, and reading that now in the light of history was really you know, a, an emotional experience was really was really sad and really something, you know, Polly had saved these words to be shared later and we were uh, in, engrossed in them and eager to share them with audiences. And Betsy, I was wondering what you found the most striking about Polly. I mean, the fact that Polly was having this private struggle uh, at a time when there was no LGBTQ community and yet accomplishing so much and just moving from area to area as an activist, um, you know, helping to desegregate restaurants uh, near Howard University in 1943. Um, you know, writing letters, a correspondence and a friendship with Eleanor Roosevelt, at the same time criticizing FDR for his failings on racial issues. Uh, the, um, the resonance of Polly's story became, I think, particularly evident to us last summer during Black Lives Matter and, and the murder of George Floyd. Polly Murray uh, in 1943 was writing just an unbelievable poem about the so-called race riots in Detroit in 1943, something else that most of us didn't learn in our history books. And this was when uh, policemen and, and white people murdered several dozen African-Americans. And, uh, you know, life just went on in America. The president didn't really say much about it, just that it was regrettable. Polly Murray took him on. Um, it, sort of in chapter after chapter of this person's life, how far ahead of the times, how prescient Polly was, and also ultimately how prescient to have saved evidence of all of this, to have saved all of the letters and the diaries, the photographs, uh, you know, going back into, you know, ch early childhood in the teens and left it in an archive and, and also for us, luckily, audio recordings of interviews that were done that allowed us to tell this story as much as possible, you know, in Polly's own voice. And uh, Betsy, this next one, I'll, uh, uh, I'll throw to you. Um, uh, why, you know, one of the most striking things uh, in the documentary is when she, uh, is when uh, Polly talks, is when we see Polly talking about 
you know, why not try to get Plessy versus Ferguson ruled unconstitutional, which yeah. was what, like 14 years before Brown versus Board of Education yeah, tried, yeah. tried to do that. And so it's very obvious that, and, and she ended up laying also, like you were saying, the groundwork for um, uh, 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 gender equality uh, under the law that Ruth Bader Ginsburg ended up uh, presenting to the Supreme Court. Why do you think Polly was so ahead of her times in terms of both her activism and her legal thinking? You know, Polly was a brilliant scholar from the time of childhood, loved to read, was an early reader, and just kept pushing and pushing to become more knowledgeable. But I think that there's something to consider about uh, the fact that Polly was non-binary. And even though this wasn't publicly known, I think it had such a profound impact on Polly's thinking and understanding that the things we take for granted, sort of arbitrary boundaries, you know, boundaries, gender, race, are just that. <laughs> They're arbitrary. And I think that's what helped Polly think outside the box to, you know, at a time when civil rights lawyers were accepting the reality of Plessy v. Ferguson. It, well, we're going to fight separate, separate but equal. We're going to fight for the equal. And Polly was saying, wait a minute. That's crazy. If they're separate, there can't be equal. It's by its very nature, it's demeaning. I mean, she was thinking so creatively about this. Similarly with women's rights, when uh, everybody else was fighting over the Equal Rights Amendment, which had been introduced every single year since suffrage and never passed, Polly was the person, one of the first people to say, wait a minute, our constitution may have the solution to this problem, or at least a partial solution to it. Let's look to the 14th Amendment and to follow the lead of civil rights lawyers and fight for women's equality that way. So she really was so innovative and, um, you know, we're, we're better off for it. And uh, Julie, uh, I'm, I wanted to ask you, uh, how difficult was it to track down uh, Polly's uh, former students? You know, the wonderful thing about Polly Murray, someone who had passed away 35 years before we started producing um, our film, uh, not only was Polly's Saving the Archive a saving grace for us in terms of the material that we had to create a documentary, but also Polly um, later in life had made a whole lot of really deep connections with younger people. Uh, that allowed us to really tell this story in a more personal way than we first uh, thought we'd be able to. That included students from Brandeis University who initially had uh, sparred with, with Polly um, over kind of the tactics of the Black Power movement. Uh, Polly was a work within the system kind of person um, for the most part. And but when the students were into building takeovers, uh, Polly was not <laughs> approving of that. And yet um, she basically formed a relationship with these two young men who became, you know, students, mentees, and deep friends such, such that all of these decades later, even talking about the, the impact of this teacher really was seemed like an emotional experience for them and an emotional experience for us in, in hearing it. I mean, the, the, you know, you talk about trying that down that came about because the film's producer, Talia Bridges McMahon, actually um, got, was able to identify a list of a number of students that had been in that class and interviewed multiple students trying to find kind of who would make the best characters. And um, the two men uh, that she tracked down, one of whom actually unfortunately passed away following following that interview, like it fit, felt, felt, felt like having that story to tell re really felt, I think, precious to us. And uh, Betsy, uh, was there, um, were there any aspects of Polly's life that you wanted to include in the film, but for whatever reason you just weren't able to include? <laughs> Yeah, well, the for whatever reason is time, basically, <laughs> and 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 keeping with a narrative arc. I mean, Polly accomplished so much that we did have to leave out some aspects of Polly's story. Uh, you know, writing uh, a compendium of racial laws in the 1950s. You know, this is before the internet. Remember, which. 
uh, Thurgood Marshall and other uh, uh, NAACP lawyers used as their kind of Bible for what laws to fight. That was Pauli's work, uh, becoming the deputy uh, attorney general of Cal State of California after getting out of uh, Berkeley, getting a master's at Berkeley Law School. Uh, being named a saint in the Episcopal church. And we didn't really go in. We used a lot of the poems in the film, which we found so evocative and 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 really we thought brought a lot of depth to, to the film, but we really didn't get into the amazing family memoir that Polly wrote, which is kind of a precursor to Roots about Polly's mixed race family, mostly in the 19th century. I mean, it just kind of goes on and on the, the things that Polly accomplished. Well, uh, Betsy and Julie, uh, thank you so much for joining us uh, for this panel, and we look forward to having you uh, back for our group chat in just a little bit. I'm Charlie Bright of Gold Derby, and I am speaking with Megan, Megan Milan, the director of the documentary Simple as Water, as part of our Behind the Lens Meet the Experts panel. Uh, first question I wanted to ask was, you know, it's uh, the five subjects are so compelling in this movie. Uh, what was the process like of, identi of, of, finding, of identifying and finding these five particular stories to tell? Massive. <laughs> I'm sorry to, uh, understatement, no. Um, elaborate, massive, careful. Um, so, you know, once uh, we had landed on this perspective of coming into the story through the point of view of parenthood, right? And the choices parents have to make during wartime. And we, uh, I had decided we were gonna do this fractured, fragmented sort of vignette structure. We then did a deep dive, research pre-production, almost mini grad school of trying to understand what are the three lines? What are the commonalities of this family experience? And so of course, first it's talking with as many Syrians who had been through it as possible. I had made a film uh, called Lost Boys of Sudan that focused on a refugee group before and had some contacts through that. So I reached out to those relationships. You know, every conversation led to two more conversations and you start hearing that there are these thematic through lines. But then, you know, part of the reason for this vignette and multiple country structure was to try and share the scale of this displacement, the scale of, of the exodus. Um, and so we were we were looking in many, many different countries. Um, one of the one of the focuses is that most refugees go to neighboring countries. So we were looking at Jordan, Lebanon and Turkey. Right. And, and so similar then you're looking at. Germany and Sweden and US. Um, so the way I worked is we had two Syrian co-producers who worked across storylines, but then each vignette had its own family, had its own particular crew. And one of the hateful things about the Syrian conflict is that half of the country has had to flee. An upside for the pre-production of that is we had a wealth of Syrians who were refugees themselves, stuck themselves in these countries, who we could pull in for these small crews. And so then I would send out little teams. Often it was a freelance journalist paired with a Syrian, either a journalist or someone who worked in the social services and in, in, in refugee aid. And they would go around meeting families. And then you're looking for, you know, that spark that makes for good cinema, somebody who, who, you know, has some magic to them, but most fundamentally somebody who wanted to share their story, because that's the most significant collaboration. And, and, you know, it's all about what layers they're going to share to us. So it was, um, you know, definitely more time spent in pre-production than, than actually filming. Um, and a lot of it is trust and relationship building. So um, something else uh, I wanted to I wanted to ask, and uh, forgive me if this is a little ignorant, and if I miss this in the movie, but where does the title of the where does the title of the movie come from? Yeah, no, you didn't miss it. It's never okay. explicitly said. Um, so "Simple as Water" is part of a full title of a collection of Syrian Syrian poetry. The full title of which is "Simple as Water, Clear as a Bullet." And um, one of our one of our Syrian advisors had recommended um, the full title to me. But what resonated for me in Simple as Water is a sense of the elemental and primal nature of it um, that that echoed the feeling that I have of parental love, of a parent's love, of a mother's love. It's very powerful, inevitable, um, forward moving. And also with water being, you know, element itself and elemental and something that 
you know, we sort of take for granted when we have it, like the love of family and then desperate for it when it's gone. So it felt fitting and it felt sort of not clear, not, you know, not too on the nose for, for a collection of very different stories. So um, uh, of, the, of the five segments that we see in there, were there any segments of the film that were more difficult to shoot and complete than the others? Yeah, I mean, emotionally, they were all challenging. So as a human being, they all had their challenges. But logistically, we have one storyline, which is inside Syria. So half, as I said, for half of the country had fled, but half of the country remained. And I felt like it was critically important to include a Syrian storyline. But I make very intimate verite films, always with my feet in the living room. You know, I'm there and I had never shot remotely like that. Um, and so we and and then you know we were trying to film a storyline very intimate lots of faces um about a family living inside a war zone and a dictatorship and so how do you you know give primacy to their safety and so we worked with uh, uh one of our advisors is Noura Ghazi is a Syrian human rights lawyer who works specifically with families of disappeared and we worked to figure out how could a first of all a family inside Syria safely share their story. And then we decided pretty early on that I wouldn't go and that we would work with us, all Syrian crew. And so we have two amazing women from Damascus who produced and shot that story. Um, they are credited in the film under pseudonyms. And I had hundreds of Skype calls and WhatsApp calls. I would They would get footage out through Beirut and send it here. And then we would go over it together. I went to Beirut and did workshops with them when they were able to, to get out. Um, but it was, you know, it was a challenge, but that, that chapter is this trust that they built with that family. I wasn't on the phone while they were shooting. It's this very sacred kind of connection in Verite that you just let things unfold. And so there was no, there was no need for me to be in there, you know, pestering. All of our conversations happened before the cameras were rolling, but, um, it was a challenge, but I, I feel like in the end it, it, it was worth it. Uh, so have there been any updates on any, uh, do you, uh, have you kept in contact with the, uh, the, the subjects and have there been any updates on, on any of their situations uh, that we've seen since uh, the filming completed? Yeah, the where are you now is always, you know, you've done your job if people want to know, you know, what's going on. So very much so. Again, one of the advantages of having our local crews is that the relationships predate our filming and then they can continue. And, you know, to a varying degree, some people want to stay in touch and want you know, to continue building a relationship and others don't. And, you know, that's that's their prerogative. But um, see if I can run through it is five stories. So there's a lot to update. But um, starting at the end with Germany. Um, so the family that you see together um, at the end, the children are thriving. They're enormous, right? The editing takes a long time on these documentaries. So Fatin is a full on teenager. They're fluent in German. You know, they're they're in school. They're they're thriving. There are challenges, obviously, you know. Um, the other, uh, Abdullah, who's his roommate, the other father in our Germany chapter, whose wife and children were still inside Syria, and she's dealing with cancer. He was granted asylum very shortly after we finished filming and was able to bring his family. So they are all together and she's receiving treatment, which is fabulous. Um, the, the U.S., the two brothers in our U.S. story, Abid and Omar, Omar has still not been granted asylum. He's still in limbo. His next interview is in 2023. Um, the whole system is backlogged, you know, for what's happening at our borders and COVID. And but Abid was granted asylum very quickly after we finished filming. And so, because their cases were independent. Um, and that helps Omar's case. Abid graduated high school. Um, Omar got married. He married a Syrian woman who had come with her extended family uh, as a refugee. So she has status. So that also helps his case. And very significantly, he was able to get an interview. Someone just gave him that extra little opportunity. He had had three years of university in computer science and, you know, was delivering for Amazon and appliances and driving Uber and all of those things. But as soon as he was just given a chance, you know, he didn't fit the human resources form, right? But as soon as someone sat down and talked with him, he was hired. He's doing quality assurance. Amazon tried to headhunt, hire him away, flew him out to Seattle for an interview. So he's doing really, really well. In Turkey, our, the family decided not to go to the center. They stayed intact. But then life continued you know, to be complicated. 
And then lastly, with Dia, who's our the mother that we focus on inside Syria, I spoke with her last week. And, you know, she's very much in the same place of, of hoping any day there'll be news and sometimes despairing and sometimes believing it's just one Facebook post away from news and, and a knock at the door. But she was um, thrilled to know the film was getting out and wants, you know, everyone to know about her son and said, you know, spread it as wide as you can. So that's they're they're all at different places. You know, there's not a lot of resolution exactly at the end of the film. And so stories go on. Huh? So um, uh, uh, as I mentioned, I mentioned before, we are an awards site and uh, you have had your own uh, experiences with awards. You won an Oscar for best documentary short subject in 2008 for Smile Pinky. Uh, what was what was your experience like uh, when you won when uh, you won that Oscar? Yeah, it's a very positive experience. I recommend it to everyone. Though I mean, there's, <laughs> there's sort of nothing like it. You know, I had been fortunate enough to have been an assistant on a film that was nominated, had a film shortlisted, but we were really lucky. Smile Pinky takes place in India, and we happened to be nominated the same year as Slumdog Millionaire. And so all of India was paying attention to the Oscars in a way that they don't normally, you know, that obviously it's a, ma a massive film uh, country, but but really we're focused on the Oscars. And so there was just an enormous amount of coverage and enthusiasm, this really intense embrace of our film. And we did after, after we took um, the Oscar back and, and the people in the film and the people that my producers and crew in India, and we traveled all around and we were on the front pages of all of the papers and Pinky met with the prime minister and the president and all sorts of good stuff happened. You know, she got the road to her village was paved and there were new wells put in and, and metal roofs. And so it was it was an incredible wave. It was I was really, really grateful to have been part of it. Well, Megan, uh, thank you so much for joining us for this panel. And uh, we look forward to seeing you uh, joining us for our group, for our group chat in just a little bit. I'm Charlie Bright of Gold Derby, and I am speaking with Julie Goldman, one of the producers of the Velvet Underground documentary, and uh, as part of our Behind the Lens Meet the Experts panel. Uh, first question I wanted to ask you, Julie, is uh, were you familiar uh, at all with the Velvet Underground or their music before becoming a part of this documentary? Oh, sure. I'm a lifelong New Yorker. And I think, you know, if you grew up in New York, you're likely to have been familiar with the Velvet Underground. Um, and I grew up with an older brother, so that always helped with my musical education. And I was very aware of the Velvet Underground and uh, John Cale and Lou Reed. Uh, you know, it, it's it's interesting, you know, a lot of the bands uh, that were high that you normally are, are highlighted around that time, you think are they talk about a lot about their, how they're Los Angeles based and the culture of Los Angeles there, uh, you know, along with the Velvet Underground, what did it mean to be like a New York based band in that time? I mean, I think everything that happened around that time was um, kind of brought together this moment where a band like the Velvet Underground could thrive the way that it did. And it was very much like the underground film scene and art, you know, the factory, musicians, all of that kind of coming together the way that it did um, was a like a perfect birthing place for a band like that. Um, yeah, I think that that in general, that music that was, you know, they were just different than any other band. They didn't sound like anyone else. They had they were totally original, but also the kind of way that they appeared, like being part of an art, you know, basically what was like art and film coming together and having films projected and music shown and Andy Warhol as their manager kind of was this very, very inspirational moment. I think as it's things, Brian Eno, who said, you know, everyone, not everyone bought the albums, but everyone who did went out and started a band. So uh, I, well, I'm wondering, you know, this was uh, the film was directed by Todd Haynes, and uh, I believe this is his first documentary feature uh, that he had done. Uh, what was your reaction like when you heard that, you know, Todd Haynes is going to make a documentary film and uh, that you were going to be uh, and you were going to be uh, one of the producers on it? Um, you know, basically, like, you know, we all pretty much passed out here at Motto with joy at that moment because... We're all huge fans of Todd's films. He's such an amazing artist. So perfectly placed to make this film. 
And the idea of working together with him on his first feature documentary was like an absolute joy. So what was the most difficult part of putting this whole documentary together? Because, you know, there are so many like, uh, you know, minute things about it, you know, like in terms of like the, the, the archival footage, the, the clips that go on there. There's so much there. What was the what was the toughest part of putting this whole thing together? I mean, there's not a, there's not much footage of the band playing live so that's the first thing um and also being able to you know we knew we had to um uh go out and be able to get uh cooperation with the uh andy warhol museum with anthology film archives um to have john kale come on board uh, maureen tucker come on board the surviving members of of the initial band um those were kind of the first things that we knew and actually the first interview that we shot was jonas mikas um, because he was so much of, at the fulcrum of, of the band um, when it started and knew so much and is uh, such a legend. So we were that was something that was really important. And actually, before we did anything, we went in the middle of a very cold winter, snowy winter day and filmed with Jonas. And that was this kind of wonderful launch to making the film. With the issue of uh, Lou Reed and his sexuality, that's that's a that's an issue. That's a, that's a that's a, a, a subject that's a very that's a very complicated subject. Um, and of course, you also have the added uh, disadvantage of Reed having passed away several years ago. Uh, were there any difficulties in how the film uh, chose to approach that issue? No, I don't think so. I mean, Todd had uh, you know there were conversations that Todd had with um, Meryl, Lou's sister. Um, you know, with a lot of people who were there at that time, I think that there's been a lot written, there's been a lot, um, a lot of music around that, that really, you know, it's, it was this very kind of powerful moment, um, for queerness that Todd has a deep understanding of. And I think that was not a particular challenge actually for him. It was more like the, how it was going to be told within the story. Um, but it was never a question that that would be part of the story. Kind of the, it was, I mean, it's um, Mary Warnov. Uh, I don't think this is in the final film, but you know, she, she would say, you know, uh, you know, uh, the bands in LA were heterosexual. We were homosexual and she wasn't a gay woman, but that's how it was that kind of queer identity that was part of what was um, driving that moment for the band and for um, the whole scene around it. So uh, you mentioned that uh, you uh, were a uh, were a fan, have been a fan of the Velvet Underground and known their music for a while. Uh, what uh, in in seeing what uh, was presented in this, what surprised? What were you most surprised to learn about the band? That's an interesting question. Uh, I think the most surprising thing was that um, that they were able to come together in so many ways because they're so thought of as fractured and that there was always the strife. But I love what surprised me is like kind of really delving into where they came from and how different they were and how they could come together. And the, that unity is really what created something as opposed to what the kind of myth about them and you know the story of Lou, just you know, kind of everybody fighting, everybody um, you know, breaking up. And instead, to me, I thought what was great was like the building of them first. And they came from such, you know, I mean, John Kale was from a Welsh mining town. Lou was from, you know, Levittown, Long Island. And, you know, it's, it's almost like this miracle that they found each other and that this band came from that. But it's that to me is the surprising thing of kind of like how they found this unity. I, as someone who, you know, you, you said, uh, you follow, you, you, you follow this band. Has, do you think that there's been any sort of act or band that has, that has been able to occupy sort of the same lane that the Velvet Underground has been in since, uh, since they came along that, uh, that, can, that feels like it's a natu- that they're a natural comparison to them? You know, it's interesting because I, I don't really think there's anybody quite like the Velvet Underground. That's why they have such staying power because the music and the albums are all so different. Um, the way that they um, have this kind of like from the, you know, the first album, what we talk about a lot in the film is the drone sound and the way that they kind of have something that is such a unique sound, 
yet then they were able to do sounds that songs that were like kind of poppy and different. Um, the the way that they kind of spoke in music is just different. And that's why I think they're an inspirational band for so many people. And they've launched so many different bands because they were like no, no one else. And they were kind of like, they happened and then they went away. You know, Lou Reed was like working as, a, you know, for his dad, you know, after the Velvet Underground counting business. I mean, it's, it's kind of a crazy story when you think about it, how quickly it happened. Also, uh, since you're a fan, I gotta ask you, Favorite Bella Underground song? I don't know. All Tomorrow's Parties have been in my head a lot lately, so I'm going to call that one. It's it's a hard choice. Well, what about that song? Do you do you, do, you, do you, it sticks out at least right now? I just love the the intro to it and the the driving of it, and it's the kind of thing that just uh, it just it has this atmosphere that it creates that I just love. And I also wanted to ask quickly about, you know, Andy Warhol and his presence in this whole thing. Uh, what about Warhol made him such a great fit for this uh, for this band and to do all this work with them? Yeah, I mean, I think it was uh, this. He basically saw something that was going to be multimedia before anybody thought of multimedia. And he it was like a part of it. And they happened to be the house band that would come together and be the, the, the sound of the, of the multimedia. And you have the films and you have the performance and you have, you know, Marion Gerard dancing on stage with the whips. And, you know, I mean, it's, it became this whole thing, which was, he's, it's his visual medium, but the idea of creating a sonic counterpart to that was, I think, really exciting for him and made something that was quite different than, than he had done before. So I think for, for Andy, it was um, this kind of coming together of all the parts, but at the same time, having something that would um, kind of make it really move in a direction that he had never really been focused on before. And I mean, getting like, and, and also the Andy Warhol films and all of the, all of the things that, that actually um, you know, kind of inform in the film, like kind of the growth of what's happening in that moment, um, you know, is, is really a lot of times it comes back to Andy and it comes back to what he was creating. Well, Julie, thank you so much for joining us on this panel and we look forward to seeing you in our group chat in just a little bit. Thanks, Charlie. Nice to speak. I'm Charlie Bright of Gold Derby and I am hosting this Meet the, uh, Behind the Lens Meet the Experts panel uh, for a documentary film featuring Dan Kogan, the producer of uh, Becoming Cousteau, Elena Fortes, the producer of A Cop Movie, Julie Cohen, one of the directors of uh, I Am Polly Murray, uh, or my name is Polly Murray, I'm very sorry about that, uh, Megan Milan, the director of uh, Simple as Water, and Julie Goldman, the producer of The Velvet Underground. Um, first question I wanted to ask is uh, to Dan, actually, and um, I want to know, uh, you know, there, we, there, we have such uh, a plethora of documentary content coming out now. And I'm curious as to what, do you, what is your favorite thing about what documentary filmmaking is like right now at this moment? I mean, I, I have to say my favorite thing is the heterogeneity of it. You know, the fact that you have folks like Todd... Um, making a doc for Apple on the Velvet Underground, or you have, um, you know, Robert Greene making a very experimental and different kind of film that Netflix bought, Procession, or you have, you know, the incredible committed um, social impact work that that folks like Megan and Julie do, like Megan and Julie do. There's just, there is such an extraordinary range of storytelling from experimental to more broad, such a wide array of subjects, and there's a bigger audience than there ever has been, you know, and that's something that inspired us for becoming Cousteau was how do we reach an entirely new generation of people? And I think that's possible now in nonfiction in a way that it wasn't before. And that um, volume and heterogeneity and um, ubiquity, you know, for those of us who started in this business, like I remember talking to Julie 25 years ago, um, when we were making films together. And it was, you know, it, we were a tiny little niche, 
you know, there was just, there was no sense of the broad appeal of these films. And now they're reaching so many millions of people and they're featured on streamers. And, and that part of it is just really exciting to those of us who've been in this priesthood for a long time. Elena, how about you? Uh, I, mean, I would definitely agree. And I, I would also, um, uh, you know, be besides kind of what's exciting about these platforms taking those risks. I also think that there there's something exciting about them producing in different countries, countries because that adds to the heterogeneity of you know the behind the cameras. And I think that's exciting as well that we're able to access you know content that is actually produced in in in, in other places that you know wasn't the case before unless you were able to go to a film festival. So I definitely agree. You know, uh, I love the whole doc world as a creator of stuff but maybe even more as a consumer there's just so much incredible stories to tell i like i, I love watching uh you know multi-part series i kind of love true crime i come a little from the true crime world love to i love to watch true crime i love animated like i don't know i, I love it all i love music docs i love i love the conventional ones i love the experimental ones there's almost uh, it, it, you know, it really feels, I kind of think on the viewer side, like an embarrassment of, of riches in a lot of ways. And I'm excited that people are out there. I mean, this year in particular, I've seen so many docs that like blew me away with how much I love them. So. I mean, echoing a lot of what everyone has said, I think the expansiveness of both the expansion of audience is so exciting that people don't, you know, think we're medicine any longer that this can a documentary can transport you and entertain and, um, and also the expansiveness of who gets to tell stories and, um, you know, and, and who we bring in and sort of the demand of um, a diversity of voices, I think it's just, and, and the demand of artistry. So I think it's just a really rich and exciting time for documentary. And uh, Julie Goldman, how about you? Well, everyone said uh, very much what uh, my thoughts are about this, but I, I mean, I think it's really right now we have um, storytelling, which is about it's storytelling. You're doing it, it happens to be documentary or it happens to be a fiction film or a series. Right now, what's happening is that the story has become the focus and the creativity of how you're going to tell that story and the tools that you're going to bring to that are feeling very limitless right now because we're able to access different styles and different languages and different um, ways of communicating with each other. And I think that with documentary, it's become, it's become finally this kind of level playing field with everything, with, with the other, any other kind of storytelling. And that's exciting after all these years to have that. It used to be, you know, people would say, oh, I love documentaries. I watch the History Channel. And now it's like, I love documentaries and they start to list all these really interesting and challenging films. And that's a huge difference. And um, next question, I wanna start uh, with uh, Megan on. Um, uh, I'm always curious with, especially with documentary filmmakers, to hear, uh, to hear, you know, what were the, fil the documentary films or nonfiction films that you saw that made you say, I want to pursue that, not just filmmaking, but that lane of filmmaking. So what were some of the uh, ones that uh, uh, got you started on, on, on this journey that you're on right now? I have one for every day of the week. So it's really hard to choose favorites among children, but Burden of Dreams is a film that I just remember sitting in and being like, whoa, you know, and I want to grab any piece of creating things like that. I haven't made a Burden of Dreams like film, but, um, you know, Les Blanks, uh, the, the director of that, who is a Bay Area filmmaker that I really admired, most of his films were very intimate and had for me at least um, inevitability about them. They felt just very sort of organic and loose and casual. And um, that really pulled me in. Um, and then um, a, a friend, but who was also a mentor of mine is John Else, um, who does all sorts of different styles of filmmaking, but I worked closely with him on a film called Sing Faster. I worked I worked very low down the chain, but um, very long hours and saw every footage, uh, frame of footage of a film that was looking at, um, called Sing Faster, looking at Wagner's Ring Cycle Opera through the point of view of stagehands. And the level of craft and artistry and complexity that they were able to weave in, in a story that was so much fun to watch is something that um, I always sort of try to be reminded of in that. 
I would say a little Dieter needs to fly and Walt with Bashir were the two films that made, you know, just a, a huge impact. Um, uh, Walt with Bashir, just the, you know, this idea that, you know, you tell yourself stories to, to about your past and, you know, how to use uh, film as a, as a way of accessing memories that you've blocked and then animated, you know, this incredible animation. I, I, I thought that film was mind blowing to this date. Like I still rewatch it. Um, and little Dieter needs to fly just, I mean, from the fact that, you know, it really made me question, you know, how bad I, I would be at terrible at, at surviving even one day, you know, in an island and just that there's just a story of this man and everything he went through. But also this idea of kind of having him re reenact those experiences in, in the places, you know, that, that became the basis, I think, for a lot of of, of, of films or maybe, you know, it, it, it had been done before. But to me, that was like the first time I saw kind of that um, play a part in 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 the actual narrative of the film that was very significant for me it's got to be errol morris's gates of heaven um it's his first film i think it's his best film it's a it's a masterpiece it's incredibly strange and emotionally powerful i've seen it easily 15 times i still don't fully understand it and it touches me so deeply every time and it really was a new direction in documentary when he made it. Um, you know, the director of Little Dieter Needs to Fly, Werner Herzog dared him and and um, didn't believe that he would ever actually make a film and then and said he would eat his shoe if he made it. And then there's a famous Les Blank short film um, called Werner Herzog Eats His Shoe. <laughs> Herzog actually doing that, Errol cooking it and eating it after Errol made the film. It's just, it it is an extraordinary work of art and the story around it is also very rich and, um, uh, you know, it, it inspired me from the first time I saw it. And that's, uh, I think that's, that, that should have been the tagline for the movie, made on a dare. Um, <laughs> uh, how about, uh, Julie Golden, how about you? Yeah, I mean, I think the films that I remember, I remember seeing Barbara Koppel's Harlan County and just being like, well, this feels really different than anything I've ever seen. I, I love Gates of Heaven, but also when I saw Thin Blue Line, Errol Morris's film, I remember see, going to see that in the movie theater and being like, what is happening here? You know, this is, it was the, the kind of wonderful unsettledness that you feel. And I worked for a company selling like documentaries to the international market and to schools and universities. That was my first job out of school during college. And I, so we had like St. Clair Bourne's films and Marlon Riggs and just incredible collections of films that of these, these brilliant filmmakers. And, and I always remember Cane Toads also, just Mark Lewis's film really stayed with me because it was, so weird and so humorous and the ability like a lot of the films we had were very serious and this was something that had um you know a, an edge to it that was really um playful and julie cohen how about you yeah i'm gonna be even narrower and say not just a film but a scene uh there's a scene in michael moore's roger and me where uh, a guy who's just been released from a mental institution is talking about his most painful inner emotions. You're seeing like a tracking shot through the falling apart streets of Flint, Michigan. The guy is saying that like when he, in, at his lowest moments, he's thinking of the Beach Boy song, Wouldn't It Be Nice as a kind of contrast to what's going on in his life. And that song starts to play as you're seeing what Flint is. And just like the emotional impact that those like 90 seconds created watching it, did make me think like whoa like isn't isn't it amazing what a combination of images music and words can do and like i i might like to do that and um uh just uh quickly i've also so we've talked about uh the films that got you that initially had that huge impact on you what are some of the documentary films that you've seen, I, I want to say like the last five or 10 years that have really left a mark on you. And uh, I want to start with uh, uh, you, Julie Cohen. Um, yeah, well, there's the date, like the ones that got, uh, so, so many, I mean, thing, I like things that are really deeply enjoyable watching experience. So at the risk of uh, kissing up a film that the other Julie produced called The Mole Agent, um, which was an Oscar nominee last year that I, you know, which just, 
Um, I love films about old people and the beauty of old people. I worked in network news for a long time where you're not supposed to talk about or acknowledge anyone over 49 years old. Um, so seeing the richness and the beauty of elderly people told in a loving, hilarious and romantic way is one of my favorite things. And uh, The Mole Agent hit all those marks for me. And how about you, Julie Goldman? Thank you, Julie Cohen. I love your films. Um, you know, Man on Wire just kind of always sticks out to me as something that was, um, you know what I loved about Man on Wire? It was, I, I remember when, when Simon Chin was pitching it and, he, and, and it was after the Twin Towers had fallen and I was like, how are you gonna do this? How are people gonna watch this film? And he's like, I, yeah, I'm, we're trying to figure it out. And then he told me he was talking to James Marsh and that James had the idea of starting the film with the building of the Twin Towers. And I was like, I just love that he came up with that and that you could find joy in this space again through this moment in time where somebody just did something for the total thrill of doing it. I, one of the things I love about that film is how that opening scene when they're talking about how they're getting into the building, it sounds like a bank heist. And it's just like, I just love how it kind of catches you off guard like that. Um, Megan, what about you? Uh, it's, it's, it's choosing favorites. This is awful um, and great and fun. Um, you know, I'm trying to think, and this might be meant more years than you said, time goes, but um, Valentino and Pina are two films that I actually gifted people on DVDs, which I don't like non-doc people and watched again and again. They just... Um, they were just transporting and fun, fun to watch. So those are two that I've been a big fan of recently, somewhat recently. There's so many good ones. And Elena? I have a lot too. I mean, that now that you mentioned Maite, I love her first film as well, La Once and, and, and The Mole Agent. Um, Leviathan is another film that made a huge impression. Um, and what else? The Arbor by Cleo Barnard was also a film I really, really loved. Um, so yeah, I guess those three <laughs> have left a, a huge mark. And Dan? Um, I'm gonna say the, it's either the second or the third film by my good friend, Penny Lane called Nuts. Um, and it is an insane, bizarre, baroquely strange story of a real life guy who the, the beginning of the weirdness is when he decides that he wants to be a doctor and tells men around the country in the early 20th century that if they can't have children, he can help them have children by implanting goat gonads into their testicles. And it only gets weirder from there. And um, uh, Penny That's does sorry. it with such an incredible sense of humor and it's such an appreciation of the profound strangeness, strangeness and the, both the sort of strengths and weaknesses in humanity that allow this guy to thrive. And it's also done in different forms of animation as well as interviews. So it mixes media in a really interesting way. It just feels like something, this special concoction that wraps you up in its own world and transports you with humor and weirdness. And, uh, you know, I love that. Well, uh, Dan, Elena, Julie C, Megan Mylan, and Julie G. Thank you so much for joining us on this panel for, for uh, Meet the Experts Behind the Lens. We wish you all the best. And uh, again, just thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having us. Thanks, Charlie. Thank nice to see you all. Bye, guys. <laughs>